on this very cold day. I'm really happy to be here to tell you about some of the work that we're doing to try and constrain cosmology by using the properties of nearby galaxies. And so the essence of what I'm going to tell you about today is in the background of this slide. Um, so there's a, a, a simulated universe here in the background, and I'm going to use galaxies like the Milky Way that look kind of sort of like this. I'll tell you more about that uh, as we go on um, to try and constrain how galaxies form and evolve within that cosmological framework. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so with that being said, here's, here's the outline of today's talk. I'm going to start off by giving you an intro to cosmological galaxy formation and how we can probe that with the kinematics of gas-rich galaxies. Um, with those basics in place, we're going to look at testing predictions using rotation curves and velocity functions of populations of nearby galaxies. And then I'm going to tell you about the present and the future. So we'll talk about wide field atomic gas surveys and the statistics of disk galaxy structure. So here's a, a compilation of local galaxies um, by uh, Peter Van Dopen a couple of years ago. And it gives you a, a sense of the richness of the structure of nearby galaxies that we see in the universe today. So everything from uh, galaxies that look like the Milky Way, so this is our nearest large neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, M or M31. There's little dwarf galaxies around our own system as well as around uh, the Milky Way. There are galaxies that look very spiral-like. There are galaxies that look like they have disks but very big bulges. There are galaxies where something really cool is happening in the center. And there are galaxies that unless we turned off the lights, you wouldn't be able to see at all. And so one of the, the goals of extragalactic astronomy today is to understand how that diversity of galaxies forms within the standard cosmological framework. So I'm going to explain to you how we think galaxies like, uh, like these ones form, um, but we're still a long ways from understanding how we get different galaxies in different circumstances and how they evolve and what the future holds. And so that'll be the, the topic of today's talk. And I am going to unabashedly focus on spiral galaxies. So all you elliptical galaxy lovers, you can wait for another colloquium speaker. I'm going to focus on disk galaxies. And there are good reasons for doing that. It's a little bit easier to eke out orbital velocities in elliptical galaxies for reasons I won't go into. Um, but we're going to focus on galaxies that look like this. And just a reminder for people who don't think about these as often as some of us, uh, some, some other folks in the room, here's a picture of a Milky Way-like galaxy that's just being tipped along our line of sight. So what we see in the sky is a projection of a disk of gas and stars. And depending on that projection, you get a different ellipticity or a different shape of this galaxy in the sky. And for all intents and purposes, I'm going to assume that these galaxies, those disks of galaxies, are round. Okay? Um, and to give you a sense of scale, so this is a true color image of a nearby spiral galaxy. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale, this is about 100,000 light years. Astronomers think in units called kilopar parsecs or kiloparsecs. A parsec is three, more or less three light years. So for the astronomers in the room, this is something like 30, par 30 kiloparsecs. Um, but I don't, I'm not going to spend very much time talking about the stars and galaxies. Instead, I'm going to tell you about the gas distributions in galaxies. And in, so instead of talking, looking at true color images, we're going to jump straight to false color. So if I take this galaxy and I plot a couple of components that you can't see at optical wavelengths, it might look something like this. So in this picture, this is the same scale as the one I just showed you, but now the stars are shown here in pink. The star formation is pinky purple, and this really faint cyan stuff is atomic gas. Most of that atomic gas is hydrogen. And we can probe that atomic gas by looking at the spin flip transition in the ground state of atomic hydrogen. The, um, there's an energetic difference between the state where the proton and the electron are aligned versus anti-aligned. And that spectral line transition produces a, a photon with a wavelength or a wave with a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Okay. Um, and so uh, the, the, just looking at the, the cartoon of this galaxy, one of the features of atomic gas in galaxies compared to the stars is that it stretches way further out from the galaxy center than the stars do. And so if you're looking for a tracer of galaxy structure well beyond where the stars end, um, atomic gas is a really nice tracer to use. And of course, because this comes from a spectral line, and that spectral line um, is it comes from a tracer that, that we say is dynamically cold, so we can get pretty precise velocities from that spectral line. We get not only the gas distribution when we map atomic gas in galaxies, but we also get the kinematics of the system. And so I'm going to show you these, these sort of rainbow maps quite a bit in this talk today. Astronomers call them velocity maps or velocity fields. And what's been done is that each pixel in the image above, so each parcel of gas, is colored according to its Doppler velocity, so the velocity along the line of sight, 
relative to the galaxy center. So the green corresponds to the, the gas that's at the, the same velocity at which the galaxy is moving away from us generally. The red is gas that's moving away from us, and the blue is gas that's moving towards us. And if you think of a, a, a spiral galaxy, like a disk of stars and gas, and you make that disk spin in your head and you tip it a little bit, and you think about what's happening in that disk, what, comp what parts of the disk are moving towards you and what parts of the disk are, are moving away from you, you can sort of get at this rainbow shape. You've got part of it coming towards, part of it, part of it coming towards, part of it going away. And if you're interested in the equation, it looks something like this for a perfectly rotating gas. And so if we can model the geometry of this system and we can model the Doppler velocities or we can measure the Doppler velocities, then we can eke out orbital velocity as a function of distance from the galaxy center. And that's what's being um, represented by this white line here. And of course, those orbital velocities tell us about the mass distribution in the system. So we can use atomic gas in galaxies to get at orbital velocities well beyond where the stars live in order to eke out the mass distributions of those systems. And once we have the mass distributions, we can compare that to what we expect from cosmological galaxy formation. So that's basically the game we're gonna play today. So those plots of orbital velocity as a function of radius, or, um, astronomers call those rotation curves. And this is a, a plot that um, you, you've probably seen before, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so orbital velocity is on the y-axis, and the distance from the galaxy center is on the x-axis. And we can use the orbital velocities of the stars in the inner part of the galaxy, and then the atomic gas extends further from the galaxy center, so those are the blue points there. Um, and then we can look at the mass implied by this rotation curve and try to understand the different contributions to that mass budget of a galaxy. And of course, it's been known for a long time that if you just take the gas and the stars in a galaxy like the Milky Way, this, this in particular is M33, um, and you plot what you would expect the rotation velocity to be given the mass distribution of the gas and the stars, you get something that falls well short of what we actually measure. So rotation curves of galaxies in the local universe are flat, and that's not what we would expect if they're all the, the only thing that was there were gas and stars, and those, the, those orbits are obeying Newton's laws. And so for a long time now, we've attributed that difference between what we observe and what we predict to dark matter. Now, I wish I could tell you what was in a dark matter sandwich. Nobody knows what's in a dark matter sandwich, and there are lots of people in this room who are working on what's in a dark matter sandwich. So I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna speculate about the nature of the dark matter in this talk. Um, what I'm gonna do is try to constrain its properties um, and uh, without trying to identify the nature of the particle. I'm gonna implicitly assume that we're talking about a collisionless particle. Um, but if you have another, uh, you know, uh, another explanation for the dark matter that reproduces the large scale structure of the universe today, it'll work just fine in this talk too. So I'm gonna assume the, the basic physical property of dark matter is that it interacts only via the gravitational force. I'm going to assume it's largely collisionless, and after that we'll, we'll, work on, we'll look at the structure of the dark matter distribution without speculating about the nature of the particle. So we can use atomic gas in nearby galaxies to measure rotation curves and get at the distribution of dark matter in the outer parts of galaxies beyond where the stars live where the mass distribution is dominated by the dark matter. And what we'd like to do is connect that to predictions for cosmological galaxy formation and what those get mass distributions should look like. And so to, we can to sort of take another step, um, we can look at a, uh, a picture that looks like this. So this is the result of a gravity-only simulation or a collisionless simulation of halo assembly. This is a redshift zero picture. And what you're looking at here is the dark matter distribution. So the color scale, stellar color scale shows the density of dark matter, where the blacky parts are parts in the universe where there is very little dark matter. And this bright yellow region in the center here, it would be the dark matter halo corresponding to a rich cluster of galaxies. So to give you a sense of scale here, we're looking at 100 million light years. And in this simulation, I can pick one of the little dots in this simulation that would be about the right mass to host a galaxy like the Milky Way and I can simulate it at higher resolution. So again here, this is a dark matter only simulation. Now we've zoomed in by uh, a factor of about uh, uh, of tens. Um, so now we're looking at on uh, the scale of a, 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 a almost a megaparsec here. Um, and if you look really carefully at this picture, this dark matter halo has two components. There's a bunch of little dots in this picture and those are, that's the substructure of the dark matter halo. Um, and my group is interested in that, but I'm not gonna tell you about that today. What I'm gonna ask you to focus on is the underlying smooth distribution of dark matter. 
And, and using the magic of PowerPoint, I can highlight that. Boom, okay? And so when people talk about the dark matter halos of nearby galaxies, this is usually the component to which they're referring. And so what we'd like to do is use the properties of the atomic gas distributions in nearby galaxies to constrain dark matter halos um, and connect that back to cosmology. And so if we were to take the galaxy that I showed you before and embed this inside the dark matter halo, it would look something like this. And we think that's a function of how galaxies form within the standard cosmological framework. They form by a dissipative collapse of the baryons uh, within the dark matter halo, conserving specific angular momentum to set up an equilibrium rotating disk. And so those baryons end up in the very center of the dark matter halo. And at least to zeroth order, this theory for how galaxies form seems to work pretty well. So if you look at the rotation velocities of nearby galaxies, and you compare that to the angular momenta that you expect dark matter halos to get via tidal torques in the very early universe, and you account for the different size scales, um, you get about the right answer. And so to zeroth order, we think that galaxies form this way. Now, remember, though, that we're talking about atomic gas in galaxies, and of course, the, the great advantage of atomic gas is that the distributions go out further than the stars, and we can measure the kinematics. And so I'm going to take this picture that I showed you before, if I can back up, right? And instead of putting the, the true color image of a nearby galaxy in here, I'm going to stick a velocity field. And so the essence of a lot of the research that my group does is to use the rotation velocities inferred from velocity maps of atomic gas in nearby galaxies to constrain the inner halo distributions of nearby systems and to compare that to what we expect cosmologically. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, so preliminaries aside, we've got this technique for measuring the inner mass distributions of galaxies and comparing to what we expect cosmologically. Let's do those comparisons and see where we're, see where we're at. So I'm gonna start here again. Um, and we're gonna use the velocity maps of nearby galaxies to measure rotation curves, and then we're gonna compare that with the rotation curves that are predicted by the mass distributions from collisionless dark matter simulations. And when you do that, you get something that looks like this, and this has been known for quite some time. So the colored points represent measured rotation curves of nearby galaxies, and if you're a, a, a nearby galaxy phone number denizen, you might recognize some of these numbers here. And so there's three different measured rotation curves of nearby galaxies, that's the color. And then if you look, um, there, there's also black curves and then a series of gray curves. And those are the, the rotation curves that one would predict for collisionless dark matter halos. So again, for folks who are experts, these are NFW halos with different concentrations and, and values of M200. And the point here is that if you look at the different distributions of the collisionless, dark, or you look at the rotation curves predicted by collisionless simulations, and those that are measured, you see there, there's a real difference in shape here, right? So this rotation, there's nothing in this, uh, in these collisionless dark matter halo shapes don't look anything like this measured rotation curve. Um, and this is often called the cusp core problem. When people, when people talk about the cusp core problem, it's maybe a term that you've heard before, um, but it generally refers to this disconnect between the shapes of nearby rotation curves and what you predict cosmologically. And so for a long time, people puzzled over why the rotation curve shapes of nearby galaxies were so different than what was predicted. And it turns out that at least some of the answer seems to lie in the inclusion of gas in simulation. So while galaxies are forming, um, the feedback and uh, the energetics and feedback from, from gas and stars can affect the inner dark matter distribution in ways that have only become uh, clear in the last decade or so. And so instead of the collisionless simulations that I've been showing you so far, um, people have started to work with simulations that also include a gas and star component. And so this is a representation of one of them. This is an illustrious simulation. So the dark matter component of this simulation is shown here on the left, and it transitions into the gas component that's shown here on the right. And this is about the same physical scale that I showed you before. So this is a, a big cluster of galaxies. And just by looking at these two different components, you can already see that there's some difference, visual differences between the dark matter component and the gas component. And that's, of course, because gas is dissipative, whereas the dark matter in these simulations isn't. And so we can ask, if we, run, if we form galaxies in simulations that include this gas component and allow for star formation and feedback to impact the inner dark matter halos, what does that do to the rotation curve shapes? What does that do to the, the mass distributions of galaxies today? And 
it, it turns out that the process of star formation and feedback at high redshift, so early in the evolution of the universe, can actually inject energy into the dark matter halo in a non-adiabatic way. So it puffs up the dark matter halo over a range of masses that we observe today. And so this is an example of a, of a rotation curve of a galaxy. So the black points are the same in the top and the bottom plots. And the black curve shows the contribution from the dark matter in this galaxy. And the top panel shows a collisionless dark matter halo. So this is a dark matter only simulation. And you can see that it overshoots in the center here. This is a manifestation of the, the cusp core problem. But when you pull a halo from a hydrodynamical simulation, that cusp is gone. And you get a really nice fit to the rotation curve. So what we've learned in the last decade or so is that halo profiles from hydrodynamical simulations can be tuned to fit nearby galaxy rotation curves. Now, whether you can do this on a population level remains to be seen. We don't yet have enough high resolution galaxy simulations, and for that matter, we don't yet have enough high resolution of rotation curves of galaxies to make this comparison one-to-one. -one. So the name of the game, in, in this case, the state of the art, is to do population level comparisons to rotation curve shapes. So let's go back to this plot, and uh, beyond the cusp core problem, there, there's, another, there's a, uh, another difference between the predicted rotation curves and that which we observe. So not only are these rotation curves, these different colored points, different from the simulations, but they're way more different from each other than the simulated rotation curves are th from each other. So in other words, dark matter halos and collisionless simulations are self-similar. All of these rotation curve shapes from the simulations, the black and the gray, look pretty similar. Whereas the morphology of the rotation curves themselves is really different. This is a rotation curve that rises to its last measured point. This is a rotation curve that rises and flattens off for most of the extent of the galaxy. And this is a rotation curve that's somewhere in between. And this has been called the rotation curve diversity problem. In other words, the shapes of rotation curves that we measure are not only different from what we expect from, from collisionless halos, but they're more diverse in their shapes. There's a wider variety of shapes than we would predict. And so we can go back to these hydrodynamical simulations, hydrodynamical cosmological simulations, and ask if the inclusion of baryons affects this prediction for galaxy diversity. Um, and, and this is a bit of a complicated plot, and I won't walk all the way through it. Um, but basically what is on the x-axis is a measure of the maximum extent of the rotation curve, and what's on the y-axis is a measure somewhere in the middle. So if you're measuring somewhere in the middle and right at the end, then the balance between those two is telling you something about the rotation curve shape. And there's a whole bunch of dots and lines on here, but the thing you need to keep in mind is that the things that are red and the black dots, those are from simulations. And the things that are in blue are from observation. So some people might recognize the things and little things sample. And the point here is that if you take the, 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 the normal sort of hydrodynamical simulations, that's indicated here in red, and you can see that there's galaxies that we observe in the local universe that have a, a ratio of the sort of middling velocity to the maximum velocity that's totally different from what you predict in simulations. And even when you, you try a little bit harder to mimic some of the non-circular motions that are present in nearby galaxies, you still have galaxies in the local universe that are more extreme than what we predict cosmologically. So the state of the art here is that it, it's not clear yet what the origin of the rotation curve diversity in nearby galaxies is and the extent to which simulations reproduce those populations or reproduce that diversity or not. Now, part of the problem here is that for, there is no selection function that quantifies any of the points on this diagram. In other words, we don't have big enough samples of nearby galaxies to specify how exactly we've selected them, and we don't have big enough samples in sim of simulated galaxies to do the same. And so it may just be that we're looking at very different subsets of two very different populations. And so what's really needed here is population level um, uh, studies where we're sure that we're selecting galaxies in the same way to try and understand or to get at the root of this diversity. So people have started to move towards looking at nearby galaxies from a population level or at a population level. And one of the ways that you can do that is by constructing what's called the velocity function. 
So this is a measure of rotation velocity on the x-axis. So this would be the flat part of the rotation curve for all intents and purposes. And then this is number density on the, x, on the y-axis. And the colored points represent what we observe for nearby galaxies. And the black, point, or the black lines represent what we predict from simulations. The collisionless simulation is shown here by this black line. And a one incarnation of a hydrodynamical simulation is shown here. And it's pretty clear that when you get to low rotation velocities, so these would be low mass galaxies, there's a really big difference between what we're observing and what you would expect from, co from cosmology. And that's about an order of magnitude. Now, it's worth keeping in mind that what we're measuring and what we're predicting are not quite the same thing. Okay? So in order to get statistical samples to do this kind of observation, we usually result to a spatially, resort to spatially unresolved detections. So most of the, the um, galaxies that make up the observed sample actually come from the old Arecibo radio telescope. So instead of spatially resolving the detection, we have a spectral line. We use the width of that spectral line as a measure of rotation in combination with some measure of the geometry of the system. So we have no information about how far out that gas goes or how it's embedded or how it might be connected to the stars. And yet on the simulation side, we're doing something totally different, right? We're looking at dark matter halos and we're looking at their mass distributions and then usually picking the velocity that corresponds to some, some peak velocity given the mass distribution if you assume equilibrium. And so these two lines d disagree, but, it, but it's not at all clear why. And there's lots of hypotheses out there for what, what's producing this effect. So it, it could certainly be new dark matter physics. Um, it could be baryonic effects that we still don't understand during galaxy formation. Or it could be something simpler like measurement or survey bias. And so to understand galaxies at a population level, it's really hard to proceed when we don't know how disks are embedded inside dark matter halos. So progress is difficult without statistics for spatially resolved disk galaxies. So we've got a technique for measuring rotation curves. We've done our comparisons to theory. We've identified some areas where there may be some tension between predictions and observations. So what's next? Well, one of the things that's next are the advent of wide field atomic gas surveys. And so these are surveys that are going to survey wide swaths of the sky, get large samples of galaxies that are spatially resolved for the first time to get a selection function from which we can measure structure and compare quantitatively to simulations. And that's what I'm going to tell you about to finish. Um, I'll start by the, the now, so what we're doing right now and the surveys that are underway. And then I'll talk about the future, which is also pretty exciting. So what we want are statistical samples of simulated and observed H1 disks. And so on the simulation side, there are larger and larger simulations that are being run with more sophisticated um, hydrodynamics and also higher angular resolution or well, higher spatial resolution, I should say, um, that better mimic the process of star formation and feedback. And so simulations are delivering statistical samples of galaxies that mimic what we observe in the low or that should mimic what predict what we observe in the local universe. And at the same time, we're starting to build statistical samples of nearby galaxies in atomic hydrogen. And so this is a recent paper by Jing Wang, where we're looking um, at the center of a, a cluster in the southern hemisphere called the Hydra Cluster. And each one of the points in this image is an H1 detection of a galaxy. And its color represents the orbital velocity of the galaxy within the cluster. So the things that are green are at the recessional velocity of the cluster. The things that are red are orbiting sort of away from us in the cluster. And the things that are blue are orbiting towards us. And so we're starting to get these wide-eye views of different large structures in the sky that we can then compare quantitatively to what we predict from simulations. And so the telescopes that deliver those kinds of data are being built now at a pace that, that we haven't seen for a very long time. There is a revolution in radio astronomy happening right now. And so this is a, 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 a list of some of the telescopes in, that my group actively uses. Um, for folks who are, have been in the field for a while, you'll recognize some of these uh, dishes and telescopes as having been, uh, having been around for a few decades now. But there are lots of new ones, like Meerkat in South Africa. There's ASCAP in Australia. Um, there's CORD, which is going to be built. It will be built in 2026. That will be in Penticton. And then, of course, in the background to all of this is the SKA. And so I can't tell you about everything that we're doing with these telescopes. I'm going to pick one, um, and I'll tell you about some of the wide field survey work that we're doing with ASCAP in Western Australia. 
So ASCAP is a new interferometer. So it's a collection of dishes that collect voltages and times of arrival to make maps of the sky. And it works in, uh, at frequencies that allow one to get H1 maps of large parts of the sky. And the technological innovation here is there's a, that there are phase array feeds that are being used as detectors. So instead of having a single pixel on the sky, there's, a wide, um, there's, there's an array of pixels. That gives us a relatively wide field of view relative to some of the other telescopes that you may be more familiar with, for example, like the Very Large Array. And so on this, um, on this facility, there are a number of surveys that are underway, but one of them is called Wallaby. And the acronym is so bad that I can't remember it and I didn't even bother to write it down. <laughs> But anyways, the W stands for wide field, and that's all you need to know, OK? So um, this is an H1 survey of the southern hemisphere. And it's got an angular resolution that's a factor of almost 10 better than the, 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 its predecessor. So for the experts in the room, it's as deep as the alfalfa survey on Arecibo, but it's got 10 times the angular resolution. So as a result, it's going to spatially resolve galaxies, tens of thousands of galaxies for the first time. And so what we're going to have for the first time are statistics. And we're going to be able to build selection functions. And those are things that we can then apply to cosmological simulations to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples in trying to understand nearby galaxy structure. Um, so the ASCAP telescope is now in the full operation phase. The full survey is now underway. These are some observations from the pilot survey. So Wallaby is delivering beautiful data. So these are velocity fields for um, uh, untargeted detections. So these are things that happen to fall within the field of view that we were observing. And this here is the resolution of those observations, or what a radio astronomer would call a beam. And so for these untargeted detections, these tens of thousands of detections, what we want to do is use them to understand the underlying structure of the systems. And of course, when you pick galaxies to show off how great your telescope is, you pick the best ones, right? So this is more like reality. <laughs> so this is your typical detection. Um, and so it's, uh, again, this is the, the distribution of gas, right? Um, and this is the resolution of the observation. And so when we model this thing and get a rotation curve, it looks, it looks kind of sort of like this, right? So you get a few points of the rotation curve. The average, the, the data quality for any given galaxy is not as great as we can do when we stare at one system for a really long time. But we've got tens of thousands of them. And so what we're trying to do is apply 3D rotating disk models, because they're required in this regime, to extract the physical structure of those systems, like rotation curves and surface brightness distributions and disk geometries. And that's what we can compare to, um, observa or to uh, theoretical predictions. And there's a rich literature, and my group is uh, expert in doing this, both in 2D and 3D, along with lots of other folks. So as I'm talking, I dare you to find the detection in the data cube that's spinning by. I promise it's there. Um, and so what you're looking at is a part of the sky where we're flipping through spectral channels that are, re um, that are set to uh, zero corresponds to the, the rest uh, wavelength of the H1 line. Um, and the point here is that when you survey the sky in an untargeted way, almost by construction, the vast majority of your detections are in a signal to noise and resolution re regime that you can just barely work with. And so the, the vast majority of resolved wallaby detections are in this regime that we've never really worked with before. And they're on the edge of modelability. And so my group is leading the effort to model these systems. Um, and we're, the focus is on robust, homogeneous models with representative uncertainties, because we're trying to do statistics with these galaxies. And no one's ever done that before. And so here's an example of a detection. I think it's this detection, but I would have to, I'd have to check with Nathan to be sure. So here's the, the gas distribution, which um, some astronomers called moment zero. Here's the, the distribution of, um, here's the velocity map, which again, you can get from a moment of the cube. And then here's a representative rotation curve. And so a lot of this work is being done within the context of the Serata collaboration, which stands for Canadian Initiative for Radio Astronomy Data Analysis. It's a multi-million dollar, multi-institution effort that's been ongoing for just about four years now to develop advanced data products for these wide field surveys. Um, Wallaby is one of them, and then there's lots of other ones as well. So here's where we are now, or here's where we were in November. Um, so we publicly released the first set of automatically generated, homogeneously produced rotation curves for untargeted galaxies. Um, and so the, the, um, the press release was that we were building intergalactic maps of the outback. 
Um, and this is work that's led by uh, the Nathan Dagg. Um, and so here are the data that we, that we publicly released. So the rotation curves for these galaxies are shown on the left. The surface densities for these galaxies are shown on the right. And basically the different colors here represent different parts of the sky that we targeted. Um, and all of these data and the models are publicly available. They're available at the Canadian Astronomy Data Center and they're also available at its Australian equivalent called CASDA. Um, and so we're, we're heading towards these uh, st delivering statistical samples of galaxies and models to the community. Here's where we're headed. Um, so what we'd really like to do is start to do population statistics with these resolved galaxies. And so um, uh, Colin Lewis, who was a PhD student here a couple of years ago, made a prediction for how well Wallaby could recover the velocity function of nearby galaxies just by using the spatially resolved subset of the galaxies that Wallaby was going to detect. And the advantage there is that you can map, you can measure the distribution of gas inside that system and therefore know that you're looking at a reasonably well rotating disk and you can measure how far out it extends from the galaxy center. And so the black line is this, the simulated universe that he, um, the, that, that he uh, envisioned and the green line is how well we think we can push down or how well we think we can recover the velocity function. And in particular, we wanted to know how far down in mass, how far down the, the velocity function we could push and still recover enough galaxies to do some statistics. And we think we can go down to maybe 35 or 40 kilometers per second given the Wallaby parameters. And that turns out to be interesting because you're in this regime in the velocity function where there's a, a disconnect between what we're currently observing using single dishes and what we're predicting from simulations. So where we're going here in the next couple of years as Wallaby collects data is to, the aim is to measure the spatially resolved velocity function from Wallaby galaxy maps. And we're gonna do it deeply enough to start quantitatively comparing theory and observations in a, in, a, in a situation where we know exactly how the atomic gas disks are embedded inside um, their apparent dark matter halos. And it turns out that when you map the sky <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, at higher resolution than you've ever done before, you find some things you don't expect. And so here's an example of what we found along the way. Um, so this is a, a galaxy that has um, a, a, a atomic gas that's associated with the stellar disk. I'm just showing you the stellar disk here. But in addition to the atomic gas that goes with the stellar disk, there's this huge ring of gas here that's at a completely different orientation. Um, and for uh, people who know Jayan English, this is one of her, um, uh, one of her uh, art creations, uh, representations of the data. Um, and so what we think this is, is a ring of gas that's basically at 90 degrees. It's, it's perpendicular to the main disk of the stars. Um, so this is a, a, people call this a polar ring galaxy or a polar ring of gas. And polar rings, there are lots of formation mechanisms that have been proposed for polar rings, but one of them is that this is a galaxy that's been accreted by the parent. And what you're looking at is the gas that's being funneled ultimately into the center of the galaxy. And so of the few hundred galaxies that we've looked at so far, we see one or two of these things that look like pretty good polar ring candidates. And so one of the things you can do when you have an untargeted survey like Wallaby is ask how frequently these things appear given the number that you've detected. So this is work by Rihanna Pileski, who's a master's student at RMC, um, where she took the, the model that we got for the galaxy I just showed you and she projected it at a whole bunch of different orientations and then looked at the velocity field that resulted. And there are some orientations where it's really easy to pick out the ring, and there are other orientations where it's really hard. And then the other thing we can do is simulate detectability at different resolutions. So at high resolution, it's pretty easy to pick out a ring, and at really low resolution, it's pretty hard to pick out a ring. And so given the selection function that's implied by the data that we have from Wallaby, and given that we found two of these candidate galaxies, we can use these kinds of comparisons to try and infer how, how, what the incidence of these polar structures is. And it turns out that we think that gas-rich polar structures like this might be an order of magnitude more common than their stellar counterparts. So stellar rings happen about one in a thousand times. This might happen more like one in a hundred or a few in a hundred. And so already with Wallaby, we're finding some pretty weird things and we're able to put them into context because we understand how, those, how the observations were taken and we can define a selection function of sorts. So I've been using the term we, and I haven't told you who we are. And believe me, we are pretty cool. 
<laughs> so this is a collection, or these are pictures, of the graduate students and undergraduate students and researchers who have worked in my group in the last year or so. There are some faces who are in the audience. There are some faces that you will recognize and some that you may have seen uh, around a little less often. I wish I could tell you all about them and all about their research, but believe me, we would be here until tomorrow. Um, so you've seen a couple of names flash by on slides as I've been talking, but everyone here is making uh, really interesting contributions to the general topics that I'm talking about. And I'm very, very privileged to work with each and every one of them. So we've talked about the now. What about the future? And the future for a lot of this work lies in the square kilometer array. So this is a picture, an artist's rendition of the SKA at night. And so um, somewhat fittingly, there's a, uh, you know, the Milky Way is represented here in the background. And this is actually a blend of several things. So this is a blend of telescopes on one continent and antennas on another continent. And if you look really carefully, it's actually a blend of real things that are on the ground right now and artist conceptions and similarly over here. Now, I'm the Canadian SKA science director, which means that I coordinate between government and universities and industry to try and ensure that the community's priorities, both scientifically, are, are well understood um, by government as well as by a sort of our industry partners, and that that meshes well with um, the, our capacity to deliver technology for these kinds of facilities that would be commensurate with a share of observing time that would be uh, um, to which the community aspires. And in the last couple of months, or last <laughs> months, my goodness, years, um, and we have put a lot of work in um, to try and raise awareness that this is a, a facility that our government needs to invest in in the long term, um, and very recently they have done so. So the SKA is 16 partners, two telescopes, one observatory. There is a low frequency component that will be, um, that's being built in Western Australia, and you can sort of see it popping out of the ground here. And then there's a mid-frequency telescope, so running from about 350 megahertz to 15 gigahertz that will be built in um, South Africa. Um, we call it SKA mid, and it's sort of popping out of the ground here. Um, and for people who are, are familiar with, these, um, with radio facilities, each one of these facilities will be a factor of a few more powerful in terms of sensitivity and resolution than its predecessor. But where these facilities really excel is in their survey speed. They'll be able to survey the sky almost 100, uh, over 100 and almost 100 times faster. So these are inherently survey machines. Um, and um, so the construction has begun. I'll show you a timeline very soon. Um, but these facilities should be ready towards the end of the decade for full observations. Um, and unfortunately, unlike these videos, these facilities don't just like pop out of the ground and build themselves, right? So there's a lot of people around the world who are working really hard to, to, put, um, to, to make this a reality. Um, and you can see that, so there's a partnership of 16 partner countries um, that, may, that are form the SKA Observatory, and right now there are eight member states. And the big news last week um, is that Canada has announced its intention to pursue full membership in the SKA Observatory. Um, so this is a press release from the National Research Council and from ICED, and they tend to be a little bit cryptic. And so you, saw, you only know what they've announced if you know the keywords to look for, and so let me illuminate you. The keywords are here. Okay, keyword number one, full membership. That means that Canada will pursue membership in an intergovernmental organization. It's gonna sign a treaty with other countries in order to do science. Our government has never done that before. Keyword number two, 6% U-share. And unless you're a Canadian astronomer familiar with the long range plan, you will not understand how exciting the number six is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but 6% is, was basically the aspiration of our community. And so this gives Canadian astronomers almost unparalleled access to this, this, to this facility when you consider the number of partner countries and the, the per capita incidence of astronomers in a given country. This is a huge percentage of this, this telescope that's unique in the world. And then the third keyword is domestic regional center is what they called it. I'm gonna shove the data in there because it's actually clear in the, the government speak um, that this is what they meant. So along with providing access to the facility, Canada's gonna build a domestic data center to handle the volume of SKA data that will, be, that will come from the facility. The SKA is gonna generate 700 calibrated petabytes of data a year. 
that's down by an order of magnitude from the raw data rate of this facility. That means that the SKA will, is as much a supercomputer as it is a bunch of steel on the ground. And so Canadians need access to those data. And this data center will be the only such data center in the Americas. And it will be a partnership. The vision is that it's going to be a partnership between different universities as well as NRC. And so this is a, a major decision that marks the beginning of a new era for Canadian astronomy. Um, we anticipate that the dollars associated with this decision will become clear in the next month or two, and it will become clear that this is one of the biggest investments that Canada has ever made in astronomy. Um, so I've told my um, astro friends that I'm using more exclamation marks than any self-respecting human being should use, <laughs> um, and I will continue to do so because this is super exciting. So what is the SKA going to do? What's the timeline? Um, so construction is underway now. It began, the construction started in, in mid-2021. Full science is a, around the end of this decade, maybe 2028, with the, uh, key science projects, so these large programs starting towards the end of the decade. Because the SKA excels as a survey instrument, that will, it will devote most of its time to these large survey programs. But because the SKA is an interferometer, it's a collection of arrays and antennas, you actually start taking data before construction is complete. And so these facilities are going to be scientifically competitive by 2026. They will be the most powerful radio telescopes in the world, even though they're still being built. And there'll be data available to the community, so that first scientific data, um, the very first scientific data will be available, or the first data, I should say, will be available in 2024. The first scientifically competitive data will be available in 2026 with full observations in 2028. Um, so we are on the verge of getting the first data from these new facilities, which is pretty exciting. Um, if you're interested in the development of the observatory or its, or its, um, uh, its technical specifications, um, there's all sorts of information online in the, so this is an operations plan as well as a construction proposal. So what is the SKA going to do? The, the more appropriate question is what is the SKA <coughs> not going to do? Okay. Um, so it was designed to have, to tackle the broadest range of science cases of any facility worldwide. And so this is a picture that represents a whole bunch of different scientific fields, everything from understanding so how planets, molecules form, um, to understanding galaxy evolution, which is what I talked about today, to cosmology, to cosmic magnetism, to testing GR, and to exploring things that go bump in the night. And so these are all fields that Canadians are participating in, and a number of these fields Canadians lead the world in. And so this, this facility is really well matched to Canadian expertise and interests, and so it's one of the reasons why it's been such a high priority for our community for so long. So the goal of the SKA is to build the world's best radio telescope and to develop new technology to do it, and while doing all of that to deliver broader impacts to society. And so those broader impacts, those goals, are framed around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So here they are right here. Um, and if you see that the purple boxes here, those are the boxes that are being tackled directly by the SKA. And so here's the vision statement. Um, and at the res um, developing sustainably, and in particular, respecting local communities, communities who are local to the sites, is key to the mission of the SKA. Um, and I, this is something that resonates very strongly with the Canadian astronomical community. There's a lot to say here. I am happy to talk more about it. Um, but actually, just earlier this week, there was a, a special issue of SKA's magazine called Contact that was released that celebrated the start of construction with ceremonies at both local sites. So this took place in December. And there's some really nice articles about connecting with local communities in particular. So this picture on the bottom shows a ceremony that was held in Western Australia. The site on which the SKA is, will be built, SKA Low will be built, is um, the, the traditional home of the Wajari Yamaji people. They are native title holders to that area. And er, late last year, there was an indigenous land use agreement. So this is an ongoing agreement that provides consent as well as benefits to those people was signed between the Australian government and the Wajari people. And then in the top part of this picture is a picture from South Africa. So these, this is a ceremony again at the commencement ceremony. And the land on which the SKA mid will be built is um, the sand people walked on that land. They're some of the oldest populations or some of the oldest people that we know to have walked the earth. And there are a variety of programs that are under place as well as in place as well as agreements to try and preserve sand culture and heritage. 
There's also a lot of local populations uh, around the SKA mid site that are being supported by um, SKA mid. So for example, for, the, in its, for its predecessor, the Meerkat telescope, about 90% of the people who work on site are local to that community, which is quite isolated and historically under, under privileged and um, uh, under-resourced relative to a lot of the rest of the African continent as well as the rest of the world. And so if you're interested, the contact magazine is a great place to start, and I'm also happy to talk more about this. So let's finish, though, by talking about galaxies. Uh, so what will the SKA do to, um, in terms of the, some of the things that I've been talking about today? How will the SKA resolve galaxies? And um, one of the ways to frame this is to look at the predictions for the gas content in galaxies across cosmic time. So this is a, a, a cone, a simulated cone of the universe that sort of starts, here's the local universe, and as you go back in space and time, you sort of go this way, and then this way, and then this way, and each little dot in this picture represents a galaxy, and it's colored according to whether the atomic gas in that galaxy is mostly atomic, those are the blue points, or mostly molecular, and those are the red points, and for the astronomers in the audience, I put the red shift here. And everything I've talked about today, the state of the art with facilities like ASCAP and the wide field surveys that we have today, is really only probing the very local universe. So we really only know how gas is distributed in galaxies in our own backyard. And that's gonna fundamentally change with the SKA. The SKA will resolve galaxies, spatially resolve individual detections up to about a redshift of one. That's roughly half the look back time of the universe. And it's, it's getting into an era where most of the gas in galaxies isn't atomic anymore. And so we're probing the growth of atomic gas in galaxies, the growth of galaxy dist, and the buildup of mass and angular momentum across cosmic time for the very first time. And for spatially resolved on detection, uh, galaxy detections, we're gonna go much further um, and well into the area where um, the, the reservoirs of gas in galaxies is mostly molecular. So there's lots of science to be done, both res with resolved galaxies as well as with spatially unresolved detections. So I'm gonna end there. The H1 kinematics of nearby disk galaxies can measure their inner dark matter halo structure and the state of the art is moving from individual galaxies to population studies. There are wide field H1 surveys, in particular Wallaby on ASCAP, that's producing the first statistical samples of rotation curves to compare to cosmological predictions. Um, and folks here at Queens are at the forefront of doing those predictions. And the SKA is gonna revolutionize this field. It's gonna allow us to know, not only do these studies in the nearby universe, but as a function of cosmic time out to a redshift of one to probe angular mo momentum and mass growth uh, in the universe. And as of last week, Canada will join the SKA. We're part of this project for its lifetime, which is predicted to be 50 years. So a new era is beginning in Canadian astronomies, and I will unabashedly continue to use exclamation marks to that effect. And I'll stop there, thanks.